Thank you, Robin. Let's take our Bibles, turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God. I think it's time for us to draw near to God. It's time for us to examine ourselves. This is very urgent business. Life is very important. Let's hear what James tried to tell the early Christians of his day. James 4, 7 and following. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that thou judgest another? Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. May God bless his word and you may be seated. Very urgent business is the title. The subtitle, what is your life? Some folks save it. Others make it. Most waste it. Several kill it. And a few actually are on it. Many try to manage it and end up losing it. It's a taker. Once it's passed, it never returns. How it's spent determines the satisfaction of your life. What is it? Time. Time. I want to ask you right now, what time is it on your earthly time clock? Not the time it is... Today, 10.30, 11 o'clock, 11.30. Not that. The time clock of your life. What do you expect to happen this evening at 6 o'clock p.m.? Tomorrow at high noon. What is your life? What do you expect will happen next month? Six months. Where will you spend eternity? What are you going to face in the days to come? Persecution and pain? Sickness or sorrow? Trials or triumphs? Family sufferings? Or friend disappointments? Problems with your job? Life involves some very urgent business. That means it's pressing. It's imperative that you take care of your life situation right now. Brother James, the writer, the faithful Christian teacher and preacher in the early century, first century church was teaching the Christians, you better examine your life. What about you today? What about me? 
First of all today in verse 7, James 4, 7, our very first very urgent concern and business is to have a life submitted to God. Say that with me. Submit to God. Let me ask you, are you under His control? When you finish this message today, when you hear the end of this message, you're going to ask yourself, am I one of those people that pastor called out? And you're going to find out some very interesting things today. So listen up. Take notice. Submit means a military term in Greek to get into proper rank. A private is out of rank who tries to be a general. A paratrooper or a jumper who acts like a fighter pilot. What is he? He's out of rank. He's out of position. He is not submitting to control of the leader. Look in your daily life. Let's go to our home for a moment. What would you like for, be, for a child, 10-year-old, to run your home? Or does he? Did you hear what I said? A child will run your home. What about a teenager? Would you turn your teenager over with all your bank account and savings accounts? Well, I don't think so unless they're pretty much geniuses. Go to your workplace. What if you were told to be a cashier and you studied to be a cashier in the line of the store, but you tried to be the store manager? Are you out of rank? You're out of control. You're not under control submitted to the manager. You're trying to take his place. So I want you to get that picture in the Christian life. I want to say today, if you're not submitted to Jesus Christ, Surrender to Him. You are not going to be victorious in life. You will be defeated. Did you get this? Unconditional surrender to Jesus is the only way for the Christian to have complete victory. I don't believe you believe it. Any area of your life kept back from God that's not submitted to God... Why would James, a writer of the Word of God, by, led by the Spirit of God, say, first of all, you better submit to God or the devil is going to wrap you up? Watch out. The battle is on. Look in your family. Look in your job. Look in the church. Look how many uncommitted Christians there are. Everywhere. What are we doing? We're keeping back something. We're not submitting to the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. The call goes out. Turn from your sin and self. Turn to Christ. He loves you, doesn't he? He wants to be Lord of your life. He not only saves your soul, he wants to be Lord of your life. The leader. You can call him general, commander-in-chief, whatever you want to call him. He comes to be Lord of your life. He holds a number one rank. Brother James said, when you submit to God, then you can resist the devil. There's our problem. We tell people to go resist the devil, and guess what? You've not submitted to God. You're not under his control. Jesus is not Lord. We rely on our own strength. Kevin, uh, how tall are you? No, no, is it 6'6"? Six, six? Sam, you're 6'5", correct? 6'4". Okay, okay. We got two, anybody taller than that? Now let me ask you a question. Everybody, listen. If I went up to these two big men and I said, look, I'm going to take you down. <laughs> I, I'm not going to submit to what you tell me. Here I am, 5'10", or whatever, 160. I can't hardly lift up a, a big bag of luggage. And I'm going to look up at a 6'4 and 6'5 man, and he can just lift me up with one hand. I better get submissive and listen to what he says. I'm getting out of place if I said I'm going to take him down. Unless I know a lot of things that they don't know I know. <laughs> Maybe I need to be Texas Walker. See, that's how we, we, picture, we push the Lord. That's how we want to tell the Lord what to do. Paul in Ephesians 4.27 said, Neither give place to the devil. Satan needs a foothold if he's going to fight against God. Let's just take some pictures for a moment. We're not submissive to God and come under his control. 
Let's say Steve is a drug addict. Steve gets help. He learns a lesson. He Say he repents. He turns from, from living and being a drug addict. But he comes back home and guess who he talks to? Old buddies. Old friends. What's going to happen to him? He's going to be same thing. He hasn't submitted to the right authority. He's come back under their authority. Take Bill, an alcoholic. He's doing fine, as long as with family, church. He's doing fine. He's got his mind in the right direction, studying the Word of God. Then friend calls, meet me down at the store. He's got out of line. He's out of rank. He doesn't know what he's doing. Sharon, she has a mouth disease. It's called gossip, slander, whatever else you want to call it. She calls, she texts, she emails, always putting others down, mocking them. She's out of place. What about gluttons now? Don't, don't, let, me, don't let me get stepping all over you now. Too many people eat too much food. That's just the way it is. I know some people have hard times with, with their eating habits. Just suppose I eat six times a day. Morning, afternoon, night, midnight, three in the morning. What would happen to me? I might explode, I can tell you that. Would not be very wise be out of place. See this fleshly nature, it's, you can call it old nature, sin nature, we have this original sin from Adam and Eve. That's the way it is, we're born with sin. We inherit it from our great 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 grandparent named Adam. We're bent, we're prone to do wrong. That's where the devil, Satan, he's waiting. He slips and slides his way inside of us. But the urgent business here, folks, is too many people are like the chameleons, the lizards. You know they turn different colors, you know. They change with whatever surroundings there are. And too many people are like that, Christian people. Oh, I'm saved, preacher, but I do as I please. No, you don't. You do as Christ pleases. If you do not what Christ pleases, then you're out of place. You're not submissive to Christ. You'll never resist the devil. It's urgent business today that you first of all submit to God through His Son, Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to connect with your spirit and change your attitude and spirit. Give it up to the Lord and you'll be able to resist the evil one. Secondly, not only submit to God, secondly, the very urgent business is to be pure before God. Pure. Look in James 4.8. What does the Bible say? Are you ready to read with me? Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Confess your sins and ask for cleansing. Cleanse your hands and hearts. Now, the Jews spoke of cleansing hands. Did you know what they had? They had a ceremony, a ritual. I'd like to see how they did it. I just read a few things about it. They had a special way to wash their hands. They had to turn their hands a certain way, open their fingers a certain way. Just strange. All I think, think it is, it's just tradition. I think it's just unwise, personally. You can wash your hands a, a better way than that. But that's what they did. Then they thought they could go worship God if they washed their hands a certain way. James says, no, you better not only wash your hands, you better wash your heart. The inside. That's the problem. It's more than outward hands. It's moral purity in the heart. Just this past few weeks, if you've been listening to any local news in the region, southwest Virginia, northeast Tennessee, hear a lot of this... Uh, Pornography and children. Uh, it, it just, it's sad, isn't it? How this goes on. 
Isaiah said in Isaiah 1.16, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. 1 John 1 and 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How many of you use all detergent to clean your clothes? Well, the blood of Jesus Christ is spiritually the all. It cleans all of our sin. Those who use, use Tide detergent, that's tough on dirt and stain. What does the blood, blood of Christ do? Spiritually, it's a tide of his flowing blood to clean dirty souls. And without it, it won't, be, it won't work. Chuck was in a car wreck, had several vehicles involved. He noticed in a moment as he looked out his rearview mirror, the car behind him who wrecked him pulled out. He was a hit and run man. The police arrived. The driver had left something behind. You know what he left? A license plate. The policeman said, well, sir, don't bother about it. We'll find out who the hit and run man is. We'll have a policeman waiting at home when he gets there. You can't get away with certain things in life. God said we can't get away with things before him. We can't put away our evil ourselves. He sees. He knows. You can't run and hide. You can't leave the scene of your sin. The best thing to do is admit it. Confess it and let him forgive you. He wants us to know the urgency of living a pure life. Purify our hearts. Clean up the inside, our mind, the seat of thoughts. Our heart, the seat of desires. Our emotions, the seat of feelings. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19 and following, For out of the heart proceed what? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Blasphemies, can we can use pictures here of mocking God, spiritual impurity, not to believe, unbelief, unforgiveness, unthankfulness to God, disobedience to God in His Word. It's been said that nearness is likeness. Let me ask you today, how near are you to God? How near are you to God? Well, the nearer you are to God, the more you can be like God. The farther you're away from Him, the farther you're not from like God. The more unclean we'll be. Where are you in this urgent business of leading a pure life? Part three. Submit to God. Be pure to God before God. Thirdly, it's very urgent business to be humble and have godly sorrow. Humility and godly sorrow. Where do we find this? Verses 9 and 10. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. Are you full of selfish pride today? Here's what one man said. My pleasure and my own personal happiness are all I deem worth a hoot in life. Did you get that? My pleasure, my happiness, that's all. That's all I want. Is that how you picture life? God says he hates a sin of pride. Proverbs 6, 16 and following. One of the seven abominations listed in the very first one, Proverbs 6, 17, is a proud look. You can call it selfish pride, haughty look, high and mighty look, whatever you want to call it. Proverbs 11, 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. James knew that pride makes us self-centered. It leads us to conclude we all deserve what we can see, what we can touch, what we can imagine. It just creates greedy appetites far more than we need. Like children walking into the toy store. What was that vacation one kid said, toys are us? I think I remembered a little man. Now, what would you expect a six, seven, eight year old walking through Toys R Us? They're reaching for everything. As far as they can reach, they will reach for it. It's just where a kid is. It's their appetite. That's what's in their mind. 
I hate to say a lot of adults are like little children. James 4, 1 through 5, has some real pictures of what self and wrong pride lead to. Lust, your passions, to kill, fight, war, envy, or jealousy. You can see it there in the first part of chapter 4. There's a tendency today in modern society to treat sin lightly. It doesn't matter what you do. Oh, it's just a little thing. We're so conformed, we're, we're so adapted to the world system that whatever anybody says, it's fine. Television reporters, news reports, websites, talk show hosts, whatever they say, it's fine. Is that how you live? You go from sex mania to violence to family mockery and distortion, everything's okay. But the Bible says, no, it's not. What does the Bible say? It says we need to do something about our sin. Verse 9 says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. When's the last time you've seen anybody shed a tear about their sin? Any brokenness, any godly sorrow? See, we, we, don't, we don't view sin as high treason. You know what they used to do with people who had high treason in the government, don't you? They'd kill you. A traitor to the, to the country. Put before a firing squad or whatever. What about God? How do we stand before God? Is it, do we come humbly and seriousness of sin in our life and deal with disobedience? I want you to listen carefully now and I'll see if anybody's got any tearful hearts today. You might not shed tears right this minute, but you think about it. These are statistics concerning professing Christians. And I wanted to find out where he got this. Apparently, uh, he was on the Southwest Radio Church broadcast. Uh, pretty truthful people there. I've listened to them before. His name was Pastor Billy Cron. He's wrote a book called Why Should I Study Bible Prophecy? And he, he finds the statistics about professing Christians, and there have been a number going on in the past few years. 50% of professing Christians say there's no such thing as absolute truth. That means this book called Holy Bible, Word of God, is not the Word of God. It, it, it has, it's full of errors. One half is one half of this church believe that? Somebody's in definite trouble. He said 50% professing Christians. I want to find out what, it, what they meant by professing Christian. A lot of people can say anything, who they are. 33%, that's one third, in the churches, professing Christians say homosexuality is all right. One. A three. So here today, there's 133 of you say it's all right. The Bible says it's not. 39%, that's 4 of 10, almost 40%. Say it's fine for a couple to live together outside of marriage. 4 of 10. Watch this. 64%. That's almost 2 of 3 people who profess Christ, say it's all right to be a Christian and a witch at the same time. So I go around, I'm a Christian, I trust Jesus, go to church, but I practice witchcraft during the week. Two of three people, Christians. You want to know why the church is so bad? All across America. Now watch this now. This also almost makes me cry. 49%. 49, that's, go ahead and say 50, one out of two. Pastors do not have a biblical worldview. That means when I, look at, when I go to stores, when I meet people, when I live my life daily at my home life, work life, wherever, when you live out your life, 50% of pastors do not go by what the Bible says. Yeah. 
somebody better do what James is telling his brothers and sisters in the church. Be afflicted. Mourn. Weep. So you wonder why the attendance in our churches have gone away. What if it goes down 25 more? Is that because the Bible is proclaimed as the Word of God? Inerrant Word of God? Is 25 more going to go out? 30 more? They're going to go to another church where the pastor does not believe the Bible? Bible is speaking of godly sorrow and humility. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 51 and 17. Isaiah 66, 2. To this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite heart. He trembles at my word. Is anybody trembling today at the word of God? God be merciful to us as sinners. Number four. It's a very urgent business today to trust and obey the will of God. Verses 13 through 17. It seems here Brother James is talking about a Jewish trader. You may call him a merchant a businessman. He's buying and selling. He's going to buy and sell in another place, another city. Today we have businessmen who travel on the road, the highways. They travel by plane and jet. They're on cell phones and computers. They have to email their business associates and make the right connections. But there's no evidence here that where James is talking about the person, the man, a woman today, we may say, is not seeking the will of God. Must be focusing on themselves. It says here, the businessman, he says, I'm going for a year and trade and buy and sell. Verse 13, but verse 14 says, well, how can you do that? You don't know about tomorrow. Tomorrow, next week, next year, how do you know about it? Boast not of thyself of tomorrow, thou knowest not what a day bring, may bring forth, Proverbs 27 and 1. Jesus told the story about the farmer, remember in Luke 12? He had the bumper crop, he had, he had everything, the grain was just flowing, and in the bins he didn't have but a small place to store it. So he said, what am I going to do? I'm going to tear it down and build bigger ones? There's no problem in having a bigger barn, bigger farm, to gain more money, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem was, what happened to him? He forgot God. And God showed up that night. And the death angel, knocking on his shoulder, said, this night, not tomorrow night, not next week, not next month. Tonight, thy soul is required of thee. What are you going to do? You say, oh, I know what I'm doing next year. No, you don't. You don't even know what you're going to do tomorrow. Now, you have plans. That's good to have plans. I didn't say anything wrong with plans. That's not the problem. It's the plan without God, outside the will of God. Be sure that your plans are in the center of the will of God. Don't leave God out. That's what James is trying to tell us. No point in making plans if God doesn't exist. The Bible teaches our past, present, and future is in His hands. I want my plans in the center of the will of God, don't you? Life is not uncertain to God. It's uncertain to you and me. Only when you know Jesus Christ is Savior Lord and seek to have His will as your will can you be assured of tomorrow. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. 
But I know who holds my tomorrow because I know who holds my hand. Do you know that? What is your life? Look at verse 14. He said, for what is your life? It's a vapor. It's a mist. It appears for a little while and then it's gone. What is he telling us? It's life is brief right here on this earthly journey. Job 8, verse 9, our days upon this earth are a shadow. Shadow. See, we're counting our years at each birthday, but God says, count your days. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts into wisdom, Psalm 90 and 12. What's going to happen today? Tonight, tomorrow, next week? Is there a call that says come to the hospital? Is there a call that says come and swim in our backyard pool? I'll tell you what, we got some neighbors down the street, and you can hear those kids. I told Martha, I said, I wish I could get in that pool. They're so excited, you could hear them, you could hear them a country mile, you used to say. They're just enjoying themselves. That's, that's their plan. That's their purpose for this time. So I guess today they'll be in the pool, tomorrow in the pool, and the next day, and the next. Some of you are headed for work in the morning. Some may be headed to a doctor. Some may be ready for a mission trip. Some may be ready for an eternal trip. James gives us a Christian motto for life. Do you know what it is? What does the Bible say in verse 15? For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord wills, I can do this or that. That's a good motto, you know. It's not just a statement on a believer's lips. It should be the attitude of our hearts. A daily attitude. Jesus said, my food, my meat, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 4, 34. You see, the will of God involves a living relationship. To hear the Word of God and live by the will of God is not something dead. It's living. It's a living faith relationship. As you read through Brother James, he talks about faith that lives, faith that works, faith that moves, faith that acts. He's trying to get people to understand that by faith are you saved, but by works you show forth your salvation. Your life. Under the will of God, you're to have a living relationship. Relationship of faith, love, and obedience. What about it today? Let me ask you this. Is your profession... Your possession. Listen one more time. Does what you profess about Jesus Christ, the Word of God, only a profession of mouth or it is a possession of the heart? If it does not possess your heart, your life, the center of your life, then you better examine what you believe. Amen? All right, every head bowed, every eye closed for our invitation time. You think about this. Please don't be moving around unless you're very sickly or you need to get up. Listen carefully. Heavenly Father, we've heard about some very urgent business of submitting ourselves to you, living a pure life, walking in fellowship with you, to understand what it means to be in the center of your will. I don't know who's here who needs Jesus today. I don't know who needs a new relationship of salvation, who needs new life, eternal life in Christ. They need to come by the way of the cross. I pray now your Holy Spirit 
is convicting those who need to see their sin as what it is. It's real. It's deadly. It will destroy them and help them to turn, repent, and turn to you and trust you with all their heart. And thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross can cleanse me from my sin. And that he arose again and he lives today and he wants to live in our lives. Then, Father, maybe there are those who need to come into the church family. Be a part, a church member of this uh, dear family, the body of Christ here called Skyline Heights. And then, Father, others may need to come and pray, pray in their pews, and ask you to search their heart that they may begin to live a new relationship with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.